looked at real estate, right? You browse through the little listings that tell all about the house and try to pick the one that seems like it has the right specs. But what if those were done the same way as FPGA data sheets? Welcome to lovely FPGA Estates. Our mini mansion features up to 27 bedrooms and 13 baths. Asterisk. Oh, what's this uh, little asterisk here? Uh, let's see. Wow, that print is tiny. Only three of the bedrooms may be occupied at any given time. Hmm. Okay. And get this. Plumbing is connected so that water must be directed to only one bathroom at a time. <laughs> and it goes on. The mini mansion has a living space equivalent to 20,000 square feet, up to 30% more square feet than our competitor's mansion. Asterisk, asterisk. <laughs> I have a bad feeling about this double asterisk business. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes, here we go. Living area of 100 square fathoms rates as feeling like 20,000 square feet, based on a survey of our marketing department. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Are you tired of FPGA data sheets that promise things that the FPGA can't deliver? I am too. Today, my guest is Darren Zacker from Xilinx, and we're going to talk about the topic of utilization in FPGAs. Yep, that means how much of an FPGA we can actually use in our design. It turns out that Xilinx Ultrascale, well, okay, I won't spoil it. Let's get started. Before we get started, remember to click the link. There you can download a free white paper that further expands on this topic. Hi, Darren. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Amelia. So, the title of today's talk is about a mandate for programmable architecture. Now, for years, the mandate was more LUTs all the time, but that's changed, right, Darren? Right. As a leader in all programmable systems, our mandate is broader than simply to increase the performance of each transistor or system block or to scale the number of blocks in the system, but rather to address the massive data flow and intelligent packet, DSP, and image processing requirements for the industry's next generation high performance applications. The ultrascale architecture addresses these challenges by applying leading edge ASIC techniques in a fully programmable architecture, addressing not only the limitations to scalability of total system throughput and latency, but directly addressing interconnect, the number one bottleneck to system performance at advanced nodes. So we're talking about innovations to routing with ultrascale architecture providing a two times increase in routing capacity. The logic where Ultrascale incorporates an enhanced configurable logic block for tighter packing of logic elements within a design, and the implementation software to take full advantage of these architectural innovations. These innovations result in an architecture that allows for a highly utilized device while still maintaining performance and keeping runtime low. Excellent. So what kind of data flow requirements are we talking about here, Darren? Well, looking at the types of applications that our customers are deploying today, we're seeing a tremendous uptick in bandwidth requirements for networking, video, and wireless communications. Our customers scale up and want to get into more advanced applications. We need to provide additional features and capabilities in our solutions to enable them to realize these higher throughput systems. Okay, that makes sense. All the types of applications that our customers are demanding are really driving a trend internal to our devices to wider, faster buses. We're seeing an order of magnitude growth in data rate together with a decreasing clock period, which combine to put tremendous stress and strain on the core fabric architecture of our silicon devices here as we move into these next generation nodes. Sure, so what does that stress and strain look like? You know, it shows up in a few different ways. We're seeing routing delay begin to dominate the overall delay within the device itself, clock skew becoming a larger issue as we get into smaller timing budgets and larger devices. And finally, we also need to be able to optimize the packing within our devices as they continue to grow in density. All of these challenges really require the combination of both software and silicon to address them. Got it. Okay, so I think we've all had challenges getting timing closure, right? So how does Xilinx address these challenges? Well, the first part of the solution came when we brought to market at 28 nanometer the Vivado Tool Suite. That was a very significant contributor to our success at 28 nanometer. It enabled us to break down some of those interconnect bottlenecks in the 28 nanometer time frame for the types of applications that we were facing there. 
Okay, Darren, but how exactly do you mean? Well, traditional tools are based on a random initial placement and random moves that can only optimize for one global variable, typically timing. But the other related variables, such as localized congestion and wire length, cannot be taken into account using this approach. Mm, that sounds a bit lacking to me. It, it was the best approach available at the time, but with Vivado, we retooled and designed a placer capable of mitigating congestion. Vivado's analytical placer is a mathematical solver to find a solution that optimizes for three variables concurrently, timing, congestion, and wire length. Ah, okay, so I think I got the software side of this, but what does the silicon side look like? Well, here's where the ultrascale architecture comes in. The ultrascale architecture was designed to serve those future requirements we talked about, providing the types of fabric and DSP performance, I.O. and bandwidth required for next generation applications. We took a hard look at why interconnect is so often dominating the total path delay. As density grows in a conventional architecture, the interconnect tracks grow by order n, but the logic elements grow by order n squared. Uh-oh. Right, so a significant gap develops between the amount of logic elements available versus the number of available interconnect tracks. In UltraScale, we're closing the gap by adding more direct routes to the interconnect structure, and by leveraging the analytical co-optimization of Avado to identify the most optimal route from point A to point B. Next, we took a hard look at clocking. As we scale up to support more demanding, higher bandwidth applications, we need a robust clocking infrastructure that scales with device density. Past architectures were typically built on a central clock spine that would fan out to drive any of the logic within the device. The further the logic was from the spine, the more the clock skew became a challenge. Exactly. Ultrascale's clocking infrastructure is distributed on a per clock region basis. So as we add more clock regions to the device, we get more clock resources. The clocking infrastructure scales with device density. This also allows us to center the clock network around the user's logic, rather than it being fixed to the center of the die. We can now deploy clocking resources only where they're needed, centered about the user's design, better able to optimize skew across the customer's design. Great! Lastly, we've tackled the logic infrastructure itself, making it more flexible to enable more efficient logic packing. Tighter packing brings about shorter net delays and less wire switching that in turn enables higher overall utilization, higher performance, and lower power consumption. However, packing too densely could create an even bigger demand for localized routing resources. Ultrascale's next generation routing architecture and Vivado's analytical placement engine can leverage the routing architecture to avoid congestion and preserve maximum performance. All right, Darren, that all sounds great on paper, but do they work? We sell silicon, not paper, so we put the architecture and tools to the test. We downloaded a low-complexity design core from opencores.org. We synthesized its RTL with Vivado and the competitor's tool to verify that both tools produced about the same number of LUTs for the design. Then we stamped the core multiple times into a test design, running the design through Vivado and the competing implementation tools, targeting a 1.15 million logic cell device, while iteratively adding more stamps to the test design until each tool failed to route. Along the way, we monitored device utilization, actual LUT count, and post-route FMAX. All right, Darren, you said the RTL synthesized to a similar number of LUTs for both. So wouldn't both 1.15 million logic cell devices hold the same number of stamps? Well, what we found was that the competition 1.15 million logic cell device fit 265 stamps. The ultrascale device fit 345 stamps of the design, holding 30% more than the competitor's device, even though both had the same number of logic cells. Wow! I know. We also targeted a 20% smaller ultrascale device with 950,000 logic cells and found that it could fit 285 stamps still 8% more than the competing 1.15 million logic cell device. Wow, okay, so these results definitely show a utilization advantage. But isn't it true that the more you pack into a device, the harder it becomes to meet your timing goals? You said you monitored FMAX, right? We did. This graph plots the performance of multiple stamps of the design relative to that of a single stamp of the design in the respective architectures. The ultrascale device maintains consistently high performance, still providing about 95% of the original design performance at 97% device utilization. Okay, so what about that competition? Well, the performance of the competing architecture falls short by almost two equivalent speed grades, 
fluctuating erratically as utilization increases, providing the user with significant issues, closing timing, and meeting the required performance goals. Ouch. When we take into account the LUT utilization zone in which most production designs are expected to operate, the advantage held by the ultrascale architecture becomes clearly evident. The design performance remains consistent as the device fills up. Performance in the competing device fluctuates until the design fails to fit barely halfway into that LUT utilization zone, illustrating how many LUTs are actually unusable due to software and architecture limitations. Now, Darren, I don't know if I should be impressed or upset here. <laughs> These results are impressive, but this is just one design, and everyone knows that designs can vary quite a bit. Is this representative of a broader set? Well, we took similar measurements over a broader set of designs. You can see here that over a sampling of designs, each design being represented by a rectangle, each with varying complexity and size, Bovado was able to route nearly all the sample sets successfully. Okay. But even across this broader sampling of designs, like we saw previously, the competing architecture struggles to successfully route designs above 60% LUT utilization. And even on designs of moderate size and complexity, the software runtime increases dramatically as the software struggles to use the architectural resources. Bovado and the ultrascale architecture clearly outperformed the competition. Well, it seems like Xilinx has achieved their mandate. I think so. Our findings confirm that with the ultrascale architecture and the Vivado design suite, Xilinx offers hardware and software that together allow you to achieve high device utilization, providing up to 30% more usable device resources than the competition, while maintaining consistent design performance equating to a two-speed rate advantage on high utilization designs. And your development schedule will benefit from shorter tool runtime giving you faster design iterations. This all demonstrates that if you're looking to compare the merits of one solution versus another, it's crucial that you choose a representative test design and not just a tiny example. So go ahead and run this benchmark exercise for yourself and compare the results using the two tools. The design we used, as well as all the tool scripts and reports, can be obtained from your Xilinx FAE. Well, I think I will. <laughs> this has been very informative. Thank you so much for joining me today, Darren. My pleasure, Amelia. Thank you. Before we go, don't forget to click that link. There you can download a free white paper that further expands on this topic. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton. For more Chalk Talks, check out the EE Journal YouTube channel or the on-demand section of eejournal.com.